Welcome to Optimus Minimus, and today we're gonna discuss the movies about the Trojan War and how they connect with the source material, Greek and Roman mythology. This is part 2 of the series on the Trojan War and the films, so please check the previous video if you've never seen it. Paris Also known as Alexander, which means either the protector of men, because Paris did some shepherd protection in his youth, or the one under protection, because he was the boy who lived. He was exposed to wild beasts and they didn't kill him. On the contrary, one of the myths tells us that he was suckled by a she-bear. You know, like Romulus and Remus but a bear instead of a wolf. Paris is usually seen by many as a weak and uh, unskilled character, but that's not entirely true. Helen of Troy and Fall of a City make him a quite reasonable and competent hero, and I'd probably say it is closer to the source material than the famous portrayal of Paris and Peterson's Troy, where Orlando Bloom brilliantly presents him as an useless idiot. Alexander's destiny is to bring doom upon Troy, unless he's killed. So he gets exposed by his parents, but survives. Peterson's Troy ignores this, other two movies pay a great deal of attention to it, especially Fall of a City, where any drop of animal's blood turns black like every 10 minutes, just to remind everyone about the curse. Peterson's Troy also doesn't give a backstory on Paris and never mentions that in the myths he was raised by the shepherd. Helen of Troy and Fall of a City have a different focus, and in case of a Netflix miniseries, have a bit more time for the character development, so they actually spend some time explaining the origin story of Paris. Helen of Troy even shows that Paris enters the tournament in Troy because of the sacrificial boo, which is quite accurate, and he wins the tournament, beating his brothers. So much for the physically weak character. Fall of a City ignores the bull, but the fighting tournament is there, plus it is the only movie that features the character of Inoni. Inoni, the nymph, is relatively important because she is the first love of Paris, and he abandoned her for Helen. Inani had healing abilities, so when Paris was mortally wounded by Philactetes, he was looking for help from Inani. She refused, but then she changed her mind when it was too late. So she killed herself. None of it is in the movies. And in Fall of a City, she's not a nymph. Although she has a son, and it is heavily implied that his father is Paris. And indeed, there is a version of a myth that tells that Paris and Inoni had a son called Corythus. His fate is quite ambiguous. There is even a strange version that tells that he fell in love with Helen and Paris killed him because he didn't recognize him. Once again, there are lots of versions of different myths, and it is quite pointless to discuss all of them. Now, to confrontation of Paris and Menelaus. Paris runs away from Menelaus in two films out of three. He doesn't try to run only in Helen of Troy, where the whole fight is interpreted in a very peculiar manner. Agamemnon poisons the spear of Menelaus so that he could get, let's call it, unfair advantage. And in Peterson's Troy, Paris basically begs his brother, Hector, to save his life. And then Hector kills Menelaus, who, according to any Greek myth, survived the Trojan War. Obviously, the main source for the Paris versus Menelaus match is uh, the Iliad, 
and the fight is quite different from the depictions in the movies. Well, in a way, Fall of a City comes closest to the original, I guess. First of all, Paris is a competent swordsman. He is uh, not Orlando Bloom's character, who has no military experience whatsoever. He could have killed Menelaus in the first attack, but he got kind of unlucky. So yeah, he's probably not as good as Menelaus, but he's not a helpless kid. If he killed Menelaus, it probably wouldn't raise any eyebrows. It seemed like a fairly realistic scenario. For sure, the fight with Menelaus went south for him, and no doubt Menelaus would have killed him. Only divine intervention could save Alexander and, well, Aphrodite snatched him from the battlefield and teleported to Helen, who wasn't impressed. She expected her husband to win and felt humiliated. Or maybe expected him to die. It's Helen, so you can't be absolutely sure what this um, narcissistic cannibal was really thinking. Aphrodite really didn't want Paris to fight at all, but occasionally he did, and in the Iliad he actually even wounded Diomedes, which is an accomplishment in itself, since Diomedes is a terrifying war machine. There is an episode present in all of the movies, Abduction of Helen. They all are a bit different, but Helen always leaves Sparta willingly. Most of the myths agree on that too, but there is a significant detail. Menelaus, Helen's husband. In the films, he is in Sparta during this abduction. In the myths, not really. In Helen of Troy, he is even conspiring with Agamemnon to kill Paris. And Helen saves Paris and helps him to escape. But as I've said, in myths, he's somewhere else, usually attending his grandfather's funeral on Crete. There's even one peculiar version of the myth that tells that Aphrodite helped Paris to seduce Helen by giving him the likeness of her husband. Paris is killed in two movies out of three. Although there is no story about Philoctetes and subsequent call for help from Inoni. In Peterson's Troy he actually managed to survive and he escapes the city with Helen, which is a very unusual development. Agamemnon In case you have forgotten, Agamemnon and his relatives belong to a brilliant aristocratic house the house of Atreus. All of them are cursed and all of them are psychopaths. Agamemnon was a relatively noble and virtuous man, I mean, by the standards of the house of Atreus. He only killed his own daughter and staged a war which ended in numerous atrocities. But he wasn't eating human flesh or something which was a significant progress if you compare him to his ancestors. Anyway, he's universally portrayed as a vile creature consumed by a thirst for power. All three movies paint this picture, but slightly change the emphasis here and there. But generally all of this is quite in line with the source material. Agamemnon is a bad guy. Kinda like Helen which we discussed earlier. Artemis, for complicated reasons involving a pregnant rabbit, uh, demanded a sacrifice of Agamemnon's daughter. So Agamemnon killed Iphigenia on the altar. The films show that uh, there was some internal struggle involved and uh, it was a point of no return. After that, he was fully invested in the war and didn't care for compromises. The Trojans can give back Helen or even 100 Helens. He doesn't care, Troy must fall. This uh, sacrifice also has to show how cruel Agamemnon was. 
Which is interesting because this nice story about Abraham and his son Isaac is seen by the Christians in a totally different way. If uh, Yahweh demands to kill your son and you agree, that's true faith. If Artemis demands more or less the same, that's horrible. In the source material, Iphigenia doesn't necessarily die. There are versions of her fate, including a version when she survives. Iphigenia in Tauris by Euripides is exactly about that. Artemis just teleports the girl to Crimea, where she's employed as a priestess until the arrival of her brother, Aristis. Yahweh, by the way, also saved Isaac. He wasn't bloodthirsty. He didn't save the daughter of uh, Jephthah in the Book of Judges, though. All of the films, except Helen of Troy, address in one way or another the conflict between Agamemnon and Achilles. Helen of Troy doesn't care much about details like that, as we know, main focus there is on Helen and Paris. But this conflict is very important. It is basically a setup of the Iliad, and it is uh, the conflict that involves the question of honor and glory. Mostly honor. And it is something that we can't overlook. These are one of the main topics of the source material. So, the conflict of Agamemnon and Achilles is technically about Bryces. Both Peterson's Troy and Fall of a City give a lot of attention to the subject, but Fall of a City gives a more complete picture as it introduces the character of Crisis and her father, the priest of Apollo. Just like with Bryces, Crisis is not really a name, it is literally a daughter of Crisis. Uh, her name is believed to be Astonomy. The Achaeans, in yet another relatively minor act of hubris, do bad things to the priest of Apollo and reduce to slavery his daughter. Crisis, the priest, or his daughter, or both at the same time, issued a formal complaint to patron god. And Apollo, who is, among other things, is uh, the god of the diseases, uh, sends a plague upon the Greeks. And uh, Agamemnon has to give Crisis back to her father. We have to mention that there is also a tradition that Crisis later actually gives her daughter back to Agamemnon, and Agamemnon has two children with her. And that's where we have a question of honor. First of all, a Greek word tima is usually translated as honor, but it is not really honor. Tima doesn't have a precise translation which is the case with many Greek words. That's why the original words are always important. Partially, also, that's why European, and not only European, languages uh, borrowed lots of Greek words. And that's why Greek words are super important when it comes, for example, to Greek or Roman philosophy, or philosophy in general. Because of precision and because some of the words became technical terms. Yes, you can, to some extent, translate, say, Plato's Aedas. Not a big deal. But you must keep in mind the original word and certain connotations. Or the great soul of Aristoteles. Or dozens of technical words used in the Stoic philosophy. Roman philosophers often consciously made a choice to write in Greek and not in Latin, because of the precision and tradition. Sorry for the digression, back to Tima. It is not honor how we understand it, probably not an honor at all. Seriously, Agamemnon abducts a woman and reduces her to slavery during the bandit raid. Honor, really. And yeah, it is also uh, sexual slavery, so it is assumed that he probably just routinely rapes her. And then gives back to her father. And then he takes Bryces from Achilles as a compensation. 
and Brysis was previously enslaved by Achilles, who, as we discussed before, probably killed her husband. So this ancient Greek concept of honor is more like a certain authority or power that has a more or less material equivalent. Agamemnon has to give back Crisis, his spoil of war, so he instantly has less honor, Time, material honor. And he doesn't like the fact that he became less honorable. So he takes it out on Achilles. He takes Brasis to show his authority. Now his honor is kind of restored and Achilles has less honor. As many researchers point out, life for ancient Greeks, and definitely for heroes of Homer, is some kind of a zero-sum game. If you have more, then I have less. So that's how Agamemnon operates with his team. And Achilles, obviously, is furious. He's the best warrior the Greek army has. And he refuses to fight for Agamemnon. So Trojans get a significant upper hand in the war. Two movies actually show Agamemnon's death. In the myths, as we all know, he is eventually killed by his wife, Clytemnestra. And it can be seen in Helen of Troy, in a form that contradicts each and every myth. She kills him in Troy while he is in the pool with Helen who became his pleasure slave after he, well, raped her. But the main reason, she wants to avenge the death of her daughter, Iphigenia. This is not how it happened in the source material, and also Clytemnestra probably never really cared that much about her daughter. She even wanted to kill her son, Orestes, since he was supposed to avenge his father's death. In Peterson's Troy, he is killed by the Bryce's Polyxena hybrid. Clytemnestra is not a character in this film. Hector Hector is relatively insignificant in Helen of Troy and Fall of a City. I mean, he's there, he's doing stuff, and he is quite brave, but in Peterson's Troy, he is one of the main characters, the Trojan Achilles, a good man and a voice of reason. And his fight with Achilles is almost the climax of the story. It is toned down a bit in uh, Fall of a City, and it is a brief event in Helen of Troy, which has almost nothing to do with the Iliad. Hector is obviously the best warrior Troy has, in the myths and in the movies. He's no match for Achilles, though, or probably even for Patroclus, although it is debatable. He fared pretty well against Ajax. Yes, he had a really long fight with him. And Ajax is considered a number two warrior in the Greek army. Hector actually fights uh, Ajax in Peterson's Troy, but contrary to everything, Hector kills Ajax. Regardless of uh, Hector's power in one-on-one -on -one combat, what matters the most is that he is the actual commander-in-chief of Troy. And during the Trojan War, he basically has more actual power than his father. What is never mentioned in the movies is that, according to most of the myths, Hector was smart enough to know that he should avoid any direct confrontation with Achilles. And that's exactly what he did up until the 10th year of war. When Achilles tried to attack him, Hector just ran away back to the city. He did a lot of running, actually. None of the depictions of the famous battle Achilles vs. Hector ever show you that in the Iliad, Hector tried to run away from Achilles and they circled the city three times. They'd 
probably circle it even more, but uh, the gods intervened with a trickery and so Hector was slain. In Peterson's Troy we can see how Helen sees Hector off when he is leaving the city to fight Achilles, which kind of underlines one interesting thing present in the myths and in the Iliad. Hector is basically Helen's only friend in Troy, apart maybe from Priam, who is also okay with her. Trojans more or less hated Helen. In Fall of a City, she even tries to change their opinion. But Hector and Priam welcomed her and never really blamed for the war. They thought it was a will of the gods and it didn't have to do much with the Spartan queen herself. Hector famously predicts the fall of Troy, enslavement of his wife, Andromache, and death of his son, Scamandrius, also known as Astyanax. And that's exactly what happens. His son is killed to destroy the king's bloodline, and Andromache is taken to slavery by Neoptolemus. Although they both survive and escape Troy in Peterson's film. There's an odd scene in Fall of a City where some random orphan boy dies of his wounds and Hector is so impressed that he names his son after him, Astyanax. It is odd on, on many levels and that's why I mention it. Hector's son was called Scamandrius after the river Scamander and Astyanax was a nickname, not a real name. And this nickname means something like Lord of the City, because Hector's son was his heir. That's not a name for a random orphan. That's not even a name. So yeah, Scamandrius is killed in most of the versions of the myth. And he is killed in Fall of a City. And Andromache is taken by the Greeks. By the way, if you never knew, in the end, she becomes a queen of a Trojan colony in Epirus, or Epirus as a whole, where she was a wife of uh, Helenus, brother of Hector. She also had a son with the uh, Neoptolemus, Molossus, and that's how the tribes of Epirus were called, Molossians. Because of this twist in the mythology, the kings of Epirus declared themselves the descendants of Neoptolemus which was reflected in the names of the kings. They had a habit of calling themselves either Neoptolemuses or Pyrrhuses, because Pyrrhus, red, is another name for Neoptolemus. And yes, you are right, that's how the famous warlord Pyrrhus got his name. He was a king of Epirus, so naturally his options for the name were extremely limited. And in turn, Pyrrhic Victory is named after him. Although this term kind of hides the fact that Pyrrhus was widely seen as one of the best generals of the ancient world. Andromache had two more sons with Helenus. Uh, one of them was Pergamus, who founded Pergamum, a very, very significant city in Asia Minor. Menelaus Menelaus is depicted in a wildly different manner in all of the three films we're discussing right now. He's a fairly ruthless Greek king in Peterson's Troy. He's a more or less sympathetic and overall quite nice character in Helen of Troy. Although he's played by James Kellis and subconsciously you always think that he's trying to help the Cylons to destroy the planet. And in Fall of a City, Menelaus is a psychopath. The version of Menelaus from Helen of Troy is probably more grounded on the myths than the others. Menelaus doesn't really have any, should we say, prominent features except that he married Helen and, in the end, practically became a god, since he was a son-in-law of Zeus. He's no psychopath, although probably most of the Greek heroes can be considered psychopaths according to modern standards. 
He's a skilled warrior, although he's not that much better than Paris as shown in Peterson's Troy. He's unfaithful to Helen in Peterson's Troy, but actually Greeks had interesting ideas of fidelity when it came to men. Probably only Hellenistic schools of uh, philosophy kind of changed their perception of things in this area. So this uh, depiction is not really inaccurate. He also had a couple of children with other women when Helen ran away with Paris. In Helen of Troy, the good version of Menelaus, the best of all the three films, goes as far as showing Helen to his guests naked, like puts her literally on a pedestal, and there she stands and shows her um, beauty to everyone. The reason for this type of behavior of Menelaus is, uh, uh, well, that's what people usually do if they have a wife, right? Other than that, he's a nice person in this miniseries, uh, kind of. Contrary to what we can see in Helen of Troy miniseries, the suitors who came to the court of uh, Tyndareus uh, Helen's human, non-biological father, never cast lots to marry her. Menelaus was chosen by Helen herself among all of the crowd that included more or less everyone, except for Achilles. So when Fall of a City mentions that Achilles was among suitors, uh, that's a stretch. It is ignored in Peterson's Troy, but it is an established thing in most of the myths, that uh, the Achaean heroes followed the call of Agamemnon, the head of the expedition to Troy and brother to Menelaus. Uh, followed not because he was a super nice person, but because of the oath to Menelaus, or more precisely to Tintareus. Tintareus was afraid that the unsuccessful suitors will start Miriam, so following the advice of Odysseus, they all made a pact that uh, they will accept Helen's choice and they will protect it. So naturally, when Helen ran away with Paris, Menelaus just called his buddies and uh, asked them to honor the oath. Once the Greeks took Troy, Menelaus wanted to kill Helen, but he couldn't because of her beauty. Actually, all of the Greek heroes wanted to kill her. There is a myth uh, when they actually tried to stone her to death, but not a single Greek could throw the stone. Helen had a built-in get-out-of-jail-free card, and she knew it. So Menelaus lived with Helen happily ever after. Helen of Troy miniseries implies that Helen will meet Paris in, in the afterlife, and he's her only one. But no, that's not how it works in the myths. The most popular version is that she shares the afterlife with Menelaus. They live in the Elysian fields up to this day. Oh, all is well that ends well. Not for Paris and Dephobos, though. They are wandering the barren lands of Hades with mutilated faces. Yeah, Dephobos wasn't the only one whose body was mutilated. Menelaus also mutilated the corpse of Paris. <laughs> And this is where we stop for today. Please stay tuned for the third part of the video. So don't forget to subscribe and activate the notifications. You should press these bell symbols as you probably know. If you have something to say, I strongly encourage you to leave a comment. So thanks for watching and see you soon.